Welcome to Studies with Stearman. Join us as we look deeper into the Bible. Strengthen your faith with us, even as we see the day approaching. And now, here's Gary. Last week, Peter, the rock, delivered a discourse as we studied it in 1 Peter 2 on the rock of our salvation. And it's really an interesting play on words because Peter was originally not called Peter at all. His name was Shimeon or Simon, son of Jonas. And he grew up in Capernaum, a Jewish fisherman. I'm sure he was literate in the sense of the scriptures. And I'm sure he attended what was a major synagogue there in Capernaum. But he had no idea what was going to happen to him later in his life when his name was changed to Peter by Christ who said of him, you are going to become a rock. And in this discourse, Peter says, not only did that happen to me, but it's happened to all of you. Because he calls us living stones who are coming to a living stone, which is Christ. Now, to review just a little bit, Jesus is called the stone of Israel, Evan Yisrael. And he is a prophetic figure. Daniel prophesied of him, saying that he would come and dash to pieces the fourth kingdom, a stone cut out without hands. He is called, as we noticed last week, the Evan Bohan, which means a stone that has been polished, it has been shaped perfectly. The shaping was done by the Father in heaven, and then the stone was Bohan. It was tested, tried, and proven. So we have a living, tested, tried, and proven stone. And I think this is far more than just a metaphor. I think that the idea of the stone, the idea of the rock, is the idea of a living temple. Now, we studied the fivefold rock of Moses back in Deuteronomy 32, where the rock is translated as capital R in English is the foundation stone for his people. And in Deuteronomy 32, Moses prophesies that the rock will save his people after evil comes to them in the latter days. And he is that stone cut out without hands. He's also the stone which the builders refused, which has become the headstone of the corner. And as such, he is And it's very difficult for us to imagine, but he's a living stone. And I think we are all going to become living stones. And I think that the kingdom of heaven in eternity is a mineral kingdom. This was taught in ancient days by the Jews that the original Garden of Eden was in heaven and it was a mineral garden, not a vegetable garden, as the one on earth was when it was made by God for Adam and Eve. The idea of a living stone, there's something eternal about that. There's something eternal about living in a body that is transcendent above our mere physical bodies and that is powered by some kind of light that we can't even imagine. We're all going to become just like him, living stones, and we're going to live forever. And he's also the foundation stone of the church, as Paul noted, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And that rock is mentioned time and again in Scripture. The fivefold rock, as I mentioned last week, Deuteronomy 32, corresponds with the five stones that David picked up as he went out against Goliath. And those five stones are a picture of the five major kingdoms that will rule the world until Jesus comes back and repairs the breach. The first kingdom, Babylon, second, Medo-Persia, the third, Greece, the fourth, Rome. We're now living in the Roman era. The fourth beast will rise up and solidify that fourth world empire until the stone that is cut out without hands comes back and crushes that empire and then establishes the fifth empire, which will be the kingdom empire of Israel. It'll be the house of David and the throne of David with the Messiah sitting upon it as a descendant of David. His image, his perfection as the rock of Israel will be seen in the kingdom days. One more thing about the kingdom, and that is this. You remember how the Israelites in the desert wandered in the wilderness. They couldn't get water, and they came to the rock near Mount Horeb. 
And God said to Moses, strike the rock with your staff, the same staff that you threw down before Pharaoh in Egypt, and water will come out. Well, it happened, and water came out, I think, by the millions of gallons. And later on, as the Israelites left that area and headed toward the kingdom, but they fell into apostasy and were thwarted in their efforts to reach Israel, they came back to that rock a second time. Now, it had already been split, but it was running no water. It was dry when they came back to it. The people says, you've brought us out here to die. And Moses got mad at the people and said, you people are absolutely unworthy of anything. But if you want water, I'll give you water. He walked over to the rock and smote the rock twice, as you all know. And that rock was called, in the first instance, Tzur, which means bedrock or giant boulder. But after he hit it with a staff, remember, it was called Selah, which means a split or a fissured rock. And he hit the split rock twice with his staff. And again, millions of gallons of water came out, but it came out without blessing. And the Lord took Moses aside and said, you're not going to go into the promised land because all you really had to do was speak to the split rock. It had been split one time and once is good enough for all time. That rock still stands there today and it's still split right down the middle, by the way. And you can see it. You can see how bedrock was literally eroded away for miles because of all the water that came out. But that's not the end of the story. If you go back to Zechariah, chapter 12 and into what's known as the little apocalypse of Zechariah, you find the end of the story of the Rock of Moses. It's very fascinating because Israel today has a water problem. I don't know whether you've followed Israel or not, but every now and then an article will come out in the Jerusalem Post or Arutz Sheva or perhaps Yediat Acharonot or one of the major newspapers in Israel and it'll talk about how Israel's running out of water and how everybody upstream is siphoning water off the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee is getting lower and lower the Dead Sea is drying up and Israel has a water problem needs water a lot it's thirsty modern Israel is spiritually thirsty People in Israel today are dry. They're dry in physical water and they're dry in spiritual water. And they're saying, Lord, you brought us out here to kill us. What are you going to do? There will come a day when the Lord steps out of the heavens. Things are going to get worse before they get better. And you read about this in Zechariah 14, 3, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against all those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. All those nations that have come against Israel are going to be defeated by the Lord, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley. Half the mountain shall remove toward the north, half toward the south, and ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Well, this is a great day when the Lord reappears. But here is the good part. Verse 8, And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, half toward the hinder sea, that's half toward the Mediterranean, half toward the Dead Sea. In summer and winter shall it be. Massive quantities of water are going to flow out of where the Mount of Olives now stands that rock's going to be split. So the rock in the desert that was split by Moses with the staff is only a type of the real rock that's going to be split. And Jesus knew about this. Can you imagine this? He sat on that very mountain with his disciples, and they said, Lord, tell us about the end of days. and Tell us how this is all going to come to an end. And so he started talking to them, and he told them, all the while knowing in the back of his mind that one of these days I'm going to come back and I'm going to stand on this place. It's going to split right down the middle and massive quantities of water are going to flow out of it. And there will not be in that day a water shortage in Israel. I guarantee. And nor will there be a spiritual shortage. That is the rock. Now we could go on for hours about the rock. But the reason Peter lays this out this way 
is so that we can fit ourselves into this marvelous picture as little stones. He is the real stone, but we are little stones. We are laid upon him as you would lay stones upon a foundation. And one of these days, it says in Revelation, we're going to become pillars in the temple of the living God. I don't know how that's all going to work, but it's going to work, and it's going to be great. And so we need to see ourselves in that light. And then Peter concludes this dissertation by saying, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And again, I repeat that that peculiar people is a fascinating title. This will be the third week I've mentioned this because it's really worth remembering. You are a peculiar people. The Greek word peripoiesis means to obtain, to acquire after great struggle or to acquire after great effort, something that is deeply desired and something that is a purchased possession. And you know, we have a picture of that. Jesus himself referred to the royal priesthood and the chosen generation as the pearl of great price, sought after by a merchant. He's talking about a merchant who would go around the world seeking the finest stones, pearls, uh, rubies, diamonds. But he's looking for one particular pearl, better than any other pearl you can think of. And pearl, of course, is an organically accreted, perfect sphere that is an absolutely wonderful symbol of the body of the living God. Because a pearl is formed over time as calcium carbonate accretes in an organic manner, layer upon layer, to form a thing of glowing beauty that just is, is indescribable. And if you have one of these an inch in diameter, it's worth millions. People have lived and died for pearls of great price. And the church is a pearl of great price. In fact, the Greek word is peripoiesis, this purchased possession. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, a peripoiesis. You are something that has been sought after by the merchant man looking for the pearl of great price. And having possessed it, he's never going to turn loose of it. That's the way it is. And then Peter says... In times past, you were not even a people. Now you're the people of God. He's quoting Hosea 1.9 in that. He said, in time past, you had no mercy. Now you have obtained mercy. And then he concludes here in this thought by saying in 1 Peter 2.11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers, pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation or your behavior honest among the Gentiles. He's still talking to the Jews here. He's talking to Hebrew Christians in the early days. He's talking to people in special times, writing from Babylon. Now, we're going to be talking about that in a new context today as we open up a new section. Having your behavior honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, and boy, did they ever speak against the Jews as evildoers, let me tell you. More than that, the new Hebrew Christians were even more scorned than the Jews. And we'll talk about that in a minute. They speak against you as evildoers. They may be your good works, which they shall behold. They may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Visitation there is a Greek word, episkopos, oversight. When somebody comes to check you out, how are you going to be doing? That's that word, in the day of visitation. Episcopos, which means to observe. You may go along for years and live in a certain way. And you may have a little niche kind of carved out for yourself in this life. You're going along and you're getting along. And your plans are going very well. But the day of your visitation will come. Somebody's going to come check you out. If you work in the workplace, you know, you might have a little cubicle. You might have an office, and you get everything humming and get it going just the way you like, and you dread the day that old Mr. Miggles is going to come by and stick his head in your door. Oh, man, because he always finds something wrong. Or worse than that, you've been doing something wrong. <laughs> he finds out about it. 
your day of visitation will come. In other words, you work in the knowledge that your good works or your evil works will be found out sooner or later. And on that basis, he says, in verse 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or to governors. In the Greek, that's hegemonos, hegemony. A group of leaders could be elected leaders. Unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. Now Peter is writing these words in A.D. 63 or 64, late 63, early 64. Just before the Roman government launched the greatest persecution of Christians that had ever been seen up to that time. These were the days of Nero. In A.D. 64, Nero was just coming into his power, and by A.D. 68, he would be gone, killed himself. But when Nero first came to power, he didn't quite know what to do with the Jews or with Hebrew Christians. For a while, in fact, he made overtures to them. He sent ambassadors saying, can you guys get along with us, and can we get along with you? And essentially, they told him to get lost in diplomatic terms. And he lost no time in declaring them enemies of state. And so a couple of years after Nero had come to power, and this is the time that Peter is writing here, he began to persecute the church. Now Nero is a historical type of the Antichrist. There's no question about it. During Nero's life, he did many, many horrible things to Jews and the new Hebrew Christians and to Gentile Christians. And when he went east on a military campaign, during that time, AD 68, Nero found himself at odds with his own government and in political difficulty. And in a fit of passion, and some say it was drunken passion, he killed himself off in Asia. Well, the word came back to Rome, Nero's killed himself. And the state of Rome was plunged into a political upheaval that lasted about a year. And during this time, there were many, many rumors to the effect that, yes, Nero had died, but he had come back to life again. And there was a theory, or a belief, which was recorded in the Roman histories. It's called Nero Redivivus, which means Nero Resurrected. And a number of people and historians wrote in those days, including Tacitus, by the way, Cornelius Tacitus, who was a patrician senator of the Roman Empire, very wealthy and very well educated. But Tacitus recorded this belief that Nero had only temporarily died, but that he was coming back from the east, and when he did, he would rule all Rome as a revived and resurrected god. Now, Satan can put together some odd ideas, but that's one of the oddest. And so this was the situation as Peter wrote this letter. So you have Nero being a type of the Antichrist. By late in the first century, this belief in the resurrected Nero had grown to cult status. That is, virtually all the Romans whispered among themselves, Nero's coming back, Nero's coming back, he's going to come back and rule again. When he does, all Rome will rise to great new heights because he will be like a god. So by the time of the death of the Apostle John in AD 96 or so, this theory of Nero resurrected was read into the text of the Revelation, the newly written Revelation of St. John in which John, as you know, in Revelation 13, writes about the Antichrist. Well, all the Christians then in the second century began to say, well, I wonder if Nero could be coming back and be the Antichrist. So this became a common belief. Now, again, Peter says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. He's writing those words under the great persecution. Nero died. After Nero died, four men tried to be emperor in AD 69. They all failed. They couldn't pull it off. Then came the Flavian dynasty, Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian, who made it their personal mission to wipe out the Jews and the new Hebrew Christians once and for all. Final solution, you might say. Vespasian came to the throne in 69, ruled till 79. 
This is during the time when the temple was destroyed. Titus came to power in 79 to 81, and Domitian came to power in 81 to 96. So from 69, just after Peter wrote this letter, until 96, there was an incredible persecution of the Christians. Domitian, the last of the Flavians, was a suspicious, cruel, tyrannical man. His whole reign was filled with state trials, show trials for treason, there were political murders, there were persecutions. The senators of Rome suffered right along with the Christians. Cornelius Tacitus was enraged and embittered by what he deemed to be the absolute collapse of the empire. He believed in Roman law, and he believed that things should proceed decently and in order, and they had just spun out of control in a wave of Christian persecutions and suspicion and tyranny. It was called the Great Reign of Terror. It ended in AD 96 with the death of Domitian. And after that, there was about an 80-year period of wonderful peace. And in fact, Gibbons, in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire, says that from about the end of the first century for the next 80 years was the finest time ever comprehended by man. Utter peace. Nobody got persecuted. Everything was fine. And you know, in that day, Christianity began to thrive. But of course, a new wave of persecutions was on the horizon. Tacitus, Cornelius Tacitus, recorded all this. And in the Annals of Tacitus, published in 117 AD, he writes these notes, which I want to repeat just to give you a flavor of the times in which Peter was writing. Tacitus says, such were the remedies of human forethought. Later, means of appeasing the gods were sought, and the Sibylline books were consulted. And these advised the offering of prayers to Vulcan, Ceres, and Proserpine, and the propitiation of Juno by the matrons of Rome. Kind of a wonderful religion they had there. This took place first on the capital, then at the nearest point on the coast, where water was drawn to sprinkle the temples and statues of the gods, women whose husbands were living performed night-long rituals, and there were solemn banquets, but no human aid, no money coming from the emperor, no supplications to heaven did anything to ease the impression that the fire had been deliberately started. This is the fire that was set that burned Rome, and the Christians were blamed for the burning of Rome, as you know. Nero looked around for a scapegoat, inflicted the most fiendish tortures on a group of persons already hated by the people for their crimes. This was a sect known as Christians. Now I'm just reading the words of Cornelius Tacitus, written around 117 AD. Let me repeat that. This was the sect known as Christians. Their founder, one Christus, that's what he called Christ, had been put to death by the procurator Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius. This checked the abominable superstition for a while. He calls Christianity an abominable superstition. This checked the abominable superstition for a while, but it broke out again and spread not merely through Judea, where it originated, but even to Rome itself, the great reservoir and collecting ground for every kind of depravity and filth. Those who confessed to being Christians were at once arrested. But on their testimony, a great crowd of people were convicted, not so much on the charge of arson, but of hatred for the entire human race. They were put to death amidst every kind of mockery, dressed in skins of wild beasts. They were torn to pieces by dogs, or they were crucified or burned to death. And when night came, they served as human torches to provide lights. Nero threw open his gardens for his entertainment and provided games in the circus, mingling with the crowd in a charioteer's dress or else standing in the car itself. These Christians were guilty and well deserved their fate, but a sort of compassion for them arose and because they were being destroyed to glut the cruelty of a single man and for no public end. Well, I could read on, but you get the idea about how Christians were treated at the time when Peter wrote these words. 1 Peter 2.13, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king, now that would be Caesar, as supreme, or unto governors. Now these would be the senators and the procurators and proconsuls as unto them that are sent by him for punishment of evildoers, for the praise of them that do well. Now Peter's writing this from the far eastern wing of the Roman Empire out in Babylon. 
and it's run, a tightly controlled Roman procurate. But Peter has this view of government and of Christians in government. And I think it's fascinating that under these circumstances he wrote these words. Verse 15, For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You think you got it tough. You think your representatives are going south on you. You think politics are bad. You think the government is anti-Christian. You haven't seen anything. Peter saw some tough, tough times. He ended up, by the way, in Rome after spending much time in Babylon. Only in the last couple of years of his life did he go back to Rome. Just before he died, they took his wife out and executed her publicly. And he shouted to her as she was being executed. This is recorded historically. He'd say, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. Remember our Lord's love. And he was crucified not long after that. But he writes these words. It is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. There are a lot of foolish men out there. There are a lot of haters of Christianity. You know, the role of the Father is to promote, to promulgate, to carry forward the faith so that it doesn't get lost. And when fathers are missing, all hell breaks loose. There are some good examples. Jean-Paul Sartre, the French atheist, his father died when he was three years old, and he fell into a hatred at the loss of his father. And in fact, those who observed his life said he hated God because God took his father. And he became a leading atheist philosopher. Albert Camus, the French atheist, who said the only thing worth contemplating is suicide. He was called an existentialist. Albert Camus' father died when he was about eight months old. He never had a father. Voltaire didn't have a father, became a notorious atheist. Bertrand Russell, very famous, one of the most outspoken atheist writers of the 20th century, lost his father as a toddler and he grew to hate God and became an atheist. Well, I just mentioned these to illustrate what Peter is beginning to broach as a topic here. First, he says, you people are part of the living temple of God, the stone cut out without hands. Secondly, you're living in a world with corrupt government. I want you to submit to that corrupt government I want you to even submit to ill treatment by your fellow man. And in so doing, you're going to honor the creation of God, and you're going to exalt the love of the Father, and it's going to persuade even foolish men that there must be something to this spiritual truth after all. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, in other words, uh, you're free. You have the free grace of the living God. You are safe in Christ. You are sanctified. Don't use that sanctification to undercut and undermine and bitterly attack your society, but rather be a promoter of the love of the living God. Show people your humble servanthood. Honor all men verse 17. What does that mean? Well, to me, it means the same thing as Jesus spoke about in the story of the Good Samaritan, in which the question was asked, who's your neighbor? And Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan who came, and this Samaritan, by the way, the Samaritans were hated by the Jews, the Samaritan was the only one who would stop and help a man who had been beaten up and robbed, and demonstrated the concept of what it is to be a neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Who lives in your neighborhood? There may be some less than <laughs> exalted people in your neighborhood. There may be people that you, if you see them coming out of their front door, you wait until they leave before you come out of your front door. I live in a neighborhood where, well, I don't even want to talk about my neighborhood, but, <laughs> but the Lord impressed me that those are my neighbors. And he said, honor all men. 
you honor all men. The most reprobate of men, you honor them. You demonstrate the love of the Lord to those men. Now, that's a tall order. But it's what Jesus did. He came and he honored all men. He really did. He could have struck them dead. He could have caused lightning to strike. He could have done a thousand things, but basically he treated all men with honor. Pharisees came to him with questions. He didn't say, get out of my sight, you dirty crook, but rather he graciously answered their questions. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Ooh, that would be, of course, Nero. If he could do that, and if the Christians who lived through the Flavian dynasty, Vespasian, Titus, Domitian, who killed Christians by the millions and tortured them, and I'm not even going to tell you how. If you want to read about it yourself, I can tell you where to read. And I, I tell you, they'll make you sick, what they used to do to Christians. Servants, verse 18. And by the way, these servants, in verse 18, are, in the grammar of the Greek, lowly servants. These are servants who have to do what they are told. These servants, you says, you're to be subject to your masters with all fears. Slavery was legal in the Roman Empire, and there were a lot of Christians who were slaves. In Rome, three-quarters of the population was enslaved to one-quarter of the population. One-fourth of the Romans were plutocrats or patricians or held political positions. The other three-quarters of the population of Rome were douloi. They were enslaved. They had to do whatever they were told or be killed. And it was legal for a slave master to kill a slave. Wouldn't even be charged. Wouldn't even be called downtown. Servants, that is a slave, be subject to your masters with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, and there were some good and gentle masters, but also to the froward, it says in the King James. And the Greek word here is scoliois. You know what scoliosis is. It means a crooked spine. Well, scoliois means crooked. What it says here is, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king, servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only the good ones, but also to the crooked ones. You got a crooked master? You be subject to that crooked master. Demonstrate the love of God even to that man. That is a high calling. That's a high calling. Have you ever worked for a bad boss? All who have worked for bad bosses raise their hands. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> a lot of hands. Everybody has. And working for a bad boss will teach you the love of God, I think, faster than probably anything in the world. For this is thankworthy if a man for a conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully for what glory is it if you be buffeted for your faults. And by the way, the Greek word for buffeted in verse 20 means to be struck with the fists. In other words, even if they whack you, they say, hey, straighten up, whack, whack, whack. Even when you're buffeted for your faults, you should take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. If you suffer wrongly, Peter says, this is well-pleasing to God. Why? Because we're here to be tested. That's why we're here, to show what we're made of. And if you are unjustly punished, persecuted, mistreated, and you take it well, God's watching. It's going to be well written up on your record. God does not forget anything. In fact, God says through Christ, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. That's in Romans. And God keeps records. He keeps little tiny notes. <laughs> and not going to forget anything. If you suffer wrongly, you're going to be blessed for that, and God will not forget. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. In other words, Jesus didn't plot, he didn't plan, he didn't work any ploys, he just told it like it was, he always told the truth, he told it straight up. He said, I haven't lied to anybody. He's taken to trial. Why do you accuse me of lying? Everything that I have said is on record, Jesus said. 
And he says, everything I have told is the truth. And Pilate said, what is truth? And Pilate was looking at the truth. There was no guile found in the mouth of Christ. And we are supposed to be just like him. We're in the process of being polished like little stones, like little evanim bachanim, little polished stones. Just like he is the big polished stone, we're supposed to be being polished. And of course, the polishing process has to chip off a few rough corners. But that's what we're supposed to be. When he was reviled, verse 23, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Have you ever asked yourself how well you would undergo torture if you were captured and held wrongly and somebody decided to make your life miserable, deprive you of food to beat you or to tie you up and throw you in a corner and you couldn't take a shower for a month and you've said to yourself, I wonder how I would do under those circumstances. I can tell you how Christ did under those circumstances. He didn't strike out. He didn't revile. He committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. In other words, he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He threw himself before God the Father, ignoring what the Jews and the Romans did to him. And you need to begin to see yourself in that light. Civil authorities can do nothing to you, really, if you're right with God the Father. 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on a tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. And here, the context particularly in Isaiah 53, 5, where this is written, refers to the healing of the sins of man, not necessarily to physical healing. Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions, that is, for our sin. He was bruised for our iniquities, that is, for our breaking of the divine law. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. What we deserve to take, He got. And with his stripes we are healed. And this healing is the healing of the breach that existed between the Father and his creation. We were all in a condition of sin, and there was a great rift between humanity and the Father until Jesus did what he did and healed that rift. By his stripes we are healed. And we should begin to see ourselves in this way, not as secular people living in a secular society, but as those who walk in heavenly places, who have appealed to God the Father and have won through grace an absolution for everything that we have ever done wrong. Divine absolution. Peter says, for ye were as sheep going astray, but are now return unto the shepherd and bishop, that is the overseer of your souls. This takes us back to verse 12. Remember? Glorify God in the day of visitation, it says back there. Visitation is from the term episkopos, which means oversight or overseer. Well, the word bishop in verse 25 is also episkopos, overseer. So we have an overseer. If you stop and think about it, in this world, you may be working for a boss. You may be working for a client. You may be responsible to someone in a high and mighty position. And in a sense, he is your overseer. But in an entirely different and higher sense, we operate in the sphere of the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. Now, this takes me back to that time by the Sea of Galilee when, after they had had breakfast by the shore of the Sea of Galilee that morning, Jesus having conversation with the men there, and turns to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, Lord, I love you. And you know the story. He asked him three times, do you love me? What's the answer? Feed my sheep. Well, how did Peter feed the sheep? Peter did. He went out and he did what Jesus asked. He fed the sheep doctrinally. This is just an example. Read this letter, and you know the heart of Peter. You know what he was teaching people. You know how he was feeding the sheep. 
He was trying to get the sheep to see themselves not as victims of secular society, but as the beloved of the shepherd and bishop of souls. You've got to see yourself in that light, not as some pawn in secular society getting kicked around by bad bosses and by bad political figures and by bad judiciary and by bad this and by bad that. You've got to begin to see yourself as living in the sphere and the oversight of the shepherd and bishop of your soul. It's all in the way you look at it. It's all in the divine perspective. And now we come to a point of focus in chapter 3. Likewise, ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands. And now we have opened an entirely new and different can of worms. (laughs) Now, there's something interesting about (laughs) this particular passage. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the behavior of the wives. What's the key idea in that verse? Well, the key idea is that the wife here is the believer, and the husband is not. The husband obeys not the word. In other words, here we have a wife who, as the Bible might put it, is unequally yoked for whatever reason. Now, in the days of Peter, this wife might be a Jewish woman who received Christ for one reason or another. Her husband might have remained a Jew, a Talmudic Jew. He might not be to the point in his own life yet where he has received the witness of Yeshua HaMashiach, he may be still a Jew. Because remember, Peter is writing to Jews from Babylon. And so one of the hypotheses here is that Peter is writing to this Jewish woman who has received Christ, but her husband is a Jew. Now, this husband, being a good Jew, is going to dominate his wife in the tried and proven Jewish fashion. This was culturally and religiously the way it was done. I'm sure that many times people and some of these wives probably came to Peter and said, listen, yeah, I believe in Yeshua. My husband doesn't. He's still going over here to synagogue, and his life is tough. He thinks I'm an idiot. What am I going to do? And Peter says, you become a living sermon to your husband <laughs> about the grace of Yeshua HaMashiach. Now, this is quite different than Paul. When you go back to Ephesians, where it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He's talking here about a marriage between two believers, that he might sanctify it, cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself as glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Husbands are commanded to love their wives in precisely the same way that Christ loved the church. There is a high calling. That calls for incredible sacrifice, man. No man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it. Husbands, you are to love your wives as you love your own flesh. Now, you look at the 20th or 21st century husband in America, and you don't see that very often, I'm telling you. You see a bunch of clods out there, you know, who who want to watch the HDTV and hit the golf course and fish and whatever, and if the wife and kids tag along, well, phooey. Or figure out a way to get away from the family any way I can. They're a drag on my, you know, they're cutting into my real life. That's kind of the American way, you know. But Paul says, oh, no, you don't hate your own body, and your wife and your children are your own body. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. Shall be joined unto his wife, they too shall be as one flesh. Now he's speaking here about the relationship between Christ and the church. He's also speaking about the marriage, because just before this he says, In Ephesians 5.22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is Savior of the body. Now, how is Christ head of the church? Is he a despot? Is he one of these blood and thunder comes through the front door and everybody runs to hide because dad's in the house? No. (laughs) Did Jesus ever make you pray? No. 
Does Jesus make you give to the church? No. Does Jesus make you give 30% of your time to the church? No. Is Jesus the kind of taskmaster who runs your life with an iron hand? No. When has he ever done that? When's he come to you and said, you haven't prayed to me five times a day, and you better start doing that, boy, or you're going to be in trouble. He doesn't operate that way at all, does he? He's the most accommodating, loving Lord you can possibly imagine. What wife wouldn't submit to such a Lord? (laughs) You see what I'm saying? Husbands, if you can be like the Lord, no problem at home. Your wife will absolutely bow down before you, and you won't even have to ask her to. We're talking about a voluntary submission here. That's what we're talking about here. Likewise, says Peter, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by a conversation or the behavior of the wives. Be a living sermon, as I said a minute ago. Wife's not to be a preacher of salvation to her husband. He doesn't get supper before he hears 15 minutes on the glory of God. (laughs) It's not, not supposed to be like that at all. She's not supposed to be a lecturer to her husband. She is to be a shining example of the love of the Lord. While they behold your chaste behavior coupled with respect. I'm going to stop right there for two reasons. One is we're out of time. (laughs) The other is that I'm about to launch into what is really an interesting observation by Peter about the relationship between husbands and wives and about the responsibility of the father. But a little preview in verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. You husbands, live with your wife, and by the way, that would go for the family too, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Well, you see right there why I'm going to stop, because a lot of women would oh, I'm not the weaker vessel. Oh, no. We need to examine that and see what it's saying and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. You husbands, you fathers, dwell with them according to knowledge. What does that mean? You must know your family like every hair on the back of your hand. You must know your family. You must know their needs, their desires, their personalities, every detail of them so that you can be an absolutely responsive overseer and so that you can convey the love of God the Father to your family in ways that they'll receive it. Fathers, deal with your families according to knowledge. Convey the love of God the Father to your family and in so doing you will have fulfilled the divine decree that has gone out since man was first created. 